I heard about Andrew actually through UVA Today. I saw a page on that he was here and he was doing this interesting thing called cognitive mapping, um, which is kind of how people think about the use of urban areas and communities and things like that. And I had a, um, been involved in some conversations with people based on some work we were doing in Chicago, trying to understand how adolescents make use of neighborhoods and how they move about. So, uh, and uh, for example, one finding that a colleague of ours had was that he was finding that these young men went to pretty dangerous for them communities far away in a relatively sudden way. And then that behavior would stop. He was tracking what they did over a year or so. But, and he's trying to figure out what's this about? What's this about? Why would they go through these dangerous areas far away and then sort of suddenly stop? And the answer was a girlfriend. But it became this way of starting to think about adolescent behavior in terms of how they make use of neighborhoods and how neighborhoods affect kids that, that is new and it's very exciting. It's different than are you in a good neighborhood or a bad one in terms of violence or economics. Anyway, so Andrew is here in the uh, Department of Urban and Environmental Planning. We had a great conversation and uh, I invited him to come talk and to get affiliated with you next because I think he brings a perspective that really can be broadening and useful for us. So we'll go ahead and let you okay. talk. All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm very happy to be here, and um, this 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 is you know opportunity. I'm I'm glad for UVA today. I'm glad it exists. <laughs> and, uh, I'm glad that um, that Patrick found me because um, this area is one that I've come to pretty re only pretty recently, and um, recently in the context of my transportation planning research. So let me explain that a little bit. But now that I have thought about it a little bit, and Hopefully, I'll get a lot of input from you as well about what I should be thinking about. Um, I'm really excited, but I think there are a lot of interesting linkages between how people travel and um, and development and learning. And you know, I don't even have the right terms yet, and so hopefully, you can teach me a few things as you know as I stand here and as we as we discuss. Um, so, you know, there are a few things that I want to be able to talk about today. And you know, it's important to keep in mind that this really is a work in progress, that where I started is not where I'm, I've ended up. But, um, but I think that there are, some, think there are some potential implications and some claims that I want to be able to make. And whether I can make them now, I don't know, but I'd like to be able to make them in the future. And I, you know, the first thing is just this general statement that I want to make is that travel and exploration and engagement with the city are developmental processes. Now, what people are learning during those processes and, and what that value is to long-term outcomes is something that I haven't answered that yet, and I don't think we have broadly yet either, but hopefully we can talk about it. Um, one of the other things, um, you know, and the way that it's a developmental process is that experience of the built environment, experience of where we've been and, the, and what we learn as we move through cities um, should have some long-term impacts. What I focus on, as I'll show you, is our long-term impacts in terms of knowledge of opportunities, knowledge of where jobs are, knowledge of where um, uh, social services are, recreational opportunities, but I think there might be a lot of things that people learn when they're out of the city. Um, now, this is, this is something that um, I can't prove yet, but I think that, but of course, I mean, we've already heard that I'm not the only one who's, who's had these thoughts, but that adolescence has to be a critical stage in gaining um, urban scale of knowledge and experience. And I'll, I'll show some information that, that leads me to believe that this is really true and really important. And that one of the things that um, we're coming to grips with in transportation planning generally is that experiences have long-term impacts, not just short-term impacts. But I think the earliest experiences are likely to have greater impacts. So being, being young, being an adolescent, and learning how to navigate the city is going to be really important in the long run how we deal with big cities, little cities, whatever they might be. So um, what I would say is that, you know, in terms of my being here, um, which is really exciting for me, like I said, I think there, there are opportunities to build links between transportation and urban planning research and education and youth, and youth development research. Um, the, the key goal here um, is to find the right questions that need to be asked from both sides, questions that that are important to both sides of that linkage. Um, but I think it is important also to remember that you know, our, our overall goal um, 
I don't know if it's right to call education applied social science. Is that is that fair? Yeah. Um, I feel that way about urban planning too. And you know, the goals are, are are positive outcomes for individuals, positive outcomes for society as a whole. And so I think we're we're both aiming for the same things. It's just how do we get there and what do we study? So anyway, so I think that it's a challenge because you know it takes a while to walk, but um, between these two places. But at the same time, um, we have the same goals. So. This is not a transportation talk um, that, that focused on transportation, but let me give you a little bit of background. I think it might be useful to you just to understand where a transportation researcher is coming from when they're thinking about some of these issues. Um, and the most important thing to remember is that for as long as transportation planning has existed as a field, or transportation engineering, you know, all of the, you know, you're much closer actually to Thornton Hall than you are to Campbell Hall, for example. Um, the goal has been, and really for the most part continues to be, um, improving mobility, lowering, um, lowering impedances between places. So making, making access, access in an urban scale, making access cheaper, easier to do, getting between places faster. That's the goal, and that's what we're charged to do from the federal government down to the local government levels. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And so one of the big outcomes from all of this is that cars were invented. And we've been rebuilding cities to um, accommodate cars basically for the past 100 years. And that's because um, it's all about access and all about getting somewhere really fast. And so that's one of the, you know, been one of the drivers of, of planning research. And lately, the driver has been, um, uh, the driver, I've been using that term, that's funny. Um, but um, lately, it's been about kind of trying to recover a little bit from what we've brought. Um, and trying to turn cities back into something that's not just about cars, and something that is more walkable. Um, the Obama administration says livable, sustainable. There's a lot of things we want to do, but it's still all about access to some degree. Um, a lot of transportation researchers and travel behavior researchers use a microeconomic framework for understanding these issues. And why that's important, I mean, it's, it's about minimizing costs, maximizing benefits, you have a certain budget, and that's how much you have available to spend on all your activities, including getting to those activities. But what I think is important about the microeconomic framework that's been kind of a, a um, that's blindsided transportation research a little bit is that it's all about um, immediate impacts. It's all about the immediate benefits to be gained. And so when we model, when we, broadly speaking, model travel behavior, we're thinking about one trip. We're thinking about the cost of taking one trip, or we're thinking about maybe a day's worth of trips. But we really very rarely think about the choices people make over the long term. And I think that's been, been, um, been a mistake to some degree. Um, but it's also very much um, part of this microeconomic framework. Now, this is not always true, and things are changing. And that's important to remember. Certainly, when we think about sustainability and the environment, we're thinking about long term impact. Um, but of course, it's a bunch of individual decisions with, with long-term impacts. Um, and then there's a new linkage between health and travel that I actually think might be an interesting model to explore when we think about development and youth development and learning and travel as well, because suddenly there have been a number of public health researchers who have come to say, you know what, walking around is good for people's bodies. Um, we should try to get people to walk around more. Or walking in traffic, um, has you, uh, well, walking traffic is very dangerous, but, um, but walking on a sidewalk alongside traffic actually has a lot of potential negative implications as well in terms of breathing pollutants, which is unfortunate that, that those things operate at the same time. But that model, what can traveling around and being in cities do for, um, uh, do to inform a particular uh, area of, um, area of research, in this case health, maybe there's something there for education. Well, I don't know. Um, now, there are some. There is research. I mean, this is not this is not completely alien to tra travel behavior research. Um, there are some findings that really suggest that the long term matters. Um, one of the important things is this idea of habit. Um, that's that's a word that we're using more and more in travel behavior research. Um, recent findings um, in this area show that. Rational choices. So again, this microeconomic model is thwarted by the fact that people like to do what they've been doing for a long time. And um, you know, we talk about pricing things to get them to change their minds, and it works to some degree. But people like to do what they've been doing. 
So, you know, there's that. Um, we've also found looking at walking and biking behaviors that people have to become habituated to something. And once they become habituated, they'll keep doing it. So that's, that's a, a clue that there's more to it than just the immediate concern. Um, there's been some research on immigrant travel behavior, and I think this is just interesting. What this, what this is showing is just, um, and this is somebody um, who did this, is somebody I worked with at UCLA while I was getting her PhD. Um, she found that it takes about 20 years for an immigrant to reach the travel behavior patterns of a, of a native-born person in the United States. So basically, um, when somebody comes from outside the US, they <coughs> transit more, they walk more, they do all these things, but about, but about 20 years after, after coming to the US, on average, of course, um, they basically behave like a native-born um, native person on average. And so this idea, again, that what, where we start off really matters. And even when you're dumped into a, you know, the US environment of cars and all that, and uh, suburban life and, and those sorts of effects, it takes a while for people to actually change their behaviors. So again, these are, these are long-term effects rather than short-term effects. Now, there's also youth travel behavior research. And certainly the Safe Routes to School program is, is a big program that a lot of states and federal government supports. Um, but that focuses specifically on school trips and making them safer and easier, um, making walking and biking um, possible, which is a very important thing. But it's about access to schools. That's what a lot of that research focuses on. There is some research on fostering independent mobility, which is, um, which is an area that I think some of what I'm doing also overlaps with a little bit. Um, trying to encourage walking and biking, um, looking at potential impacts in terms of community, safety, well-being, um, when people are able to, when young people are able to um, control their own travel decisions to some degree. There is some research on that, but it's pretty limited. And then, you know, because we're very concerned about the environment um, in planning, uh, there's been a lot of em uh, emphasis on looking at attitudes <coughs> towards sustainable travel behaviors. So what are the problems with getting teens to want to bike more in it, you know, uh, I mean, cycling apparently, um, it's been a while since I've been a teen, but cycling is something that young people tend to do more when they're in their early teens, and then as they get older, they reject it to some degree as being uncool or, or you know, whatever, whatever the issues are around that. So there have been some findings around that. And um, there have also been um, some studies of just recent trends in youth mobility, and there's some fascinating things going on where um, young people are not getting their driver's licenses as quickly. I think there's some policy reasons for that as well. But um, people aren't, young people aren't driving as much as their predecessors did. And so there's a lot of interest in why that might be. Um, and this is, this is from Safe Routes to School Research and just shows how much change there really has been in the way people get around, um, in the way people get to, children get to school. And um, over the past 40 years or so, and that walking and biking has been decimated as a mode for getting to school, and uh, driving has become much more important. And there's a lot of things to, um, there are a lot of reasons for that that um, we may or may not have time, excuse me, have time to discuss. So let me get into the research that I've been working on um, specifically, and how it ties into those larger issues, but also um, you know, leading into the questions that I have for you as well. Um, cognitive mapping. So the approach that I've been taking, and this, this research started for me about, I would say five years ago, as I, you know, this was uh, the centerpiece of, of some of my dissertation research that I've since been carrying on. And um, it focus, focuses on, the, on this notion that people don't just make decisions in some kind of, <coughs> set, uh, it, make decisions about where to go in cities and um, how to travel in some sort of, um, situation of perfect information, like a, an economist might argue for, but that they know some things and they don't know other things, and the information they have is stored in a cognitive map. And this is part of environmental psychology, um, the idea that um, we encode spatial information and then we make decisions based on the spatial information that is stored in our head. And so um, this is an important factor because we can compare among groups in terms of how good their cognitive map is, good being a very loaded term, but the differences between cognitive maps. And we can also, um, we can also uh, look for instances where cognitive maps are failing, failing individuals, and where people are missing out on opportunities 
because they just don't know they exist. And so that, you know, that is where I started with this. Um, there is some youth research um, on youth cognitive maps and traveling, you know, at different ways of traveling and developing a cognitive map. Interestingly, and I, interestingly, most of this is in Europe. Most of that research is in Europe. There's very little here, mostly, mostly in Northern Europe, Sweden, um, the Northern UK. Um, I don't know what it is about the North, the maps, but, um, but it isn't, it isn't necessarily, um, uh, it isn't, it, the findings, the theoretical findings are very interesting, but there aren't as many direct um, investigations of how things are in the United States. Um, and here's, a, here's an image from 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, um, in a book by an urban designer named Kevin Lynch, who really popularized the idea of cognitive maps for urban designers. Um, this is a book called The Image of the City, and what it shows is that the city isn't just a map, it is comprised of elements that people store, um, store in their heads, and they make decisions based on where edges are, where barriers are, um, what districts they know about, what they don't know about. Now today, um, there are a lot of other uh, approaches beyond just creating this, this kind of nice image. Um, there are a lot of research approaches that I've used and other researchers have used to aggregate cognitive maps, look at, look at different people's maps and where the differences are, um, use geographic information systems, mapping techniques to um, determine where boundaries are in people's cognitive maps, where they, uh, in places they won't go, <coughs> things like that. And, and again, you know, maybe they have reasons to cross those boundaries sometimes when love is involved, but often they won't. <laughs> um, so those are, all, those are all parts of the new approach to cognitive mapping that, and something that I've been, been looking into. Now, specifically in terms of cognitive mapping and travel, um, there is a set of theorization and, and research, you know, primary research in this area that, that posits a few things that are, that are worth thinking about. Um, travel experiences are the primary source of spatial knowledge. Um, in this cognitive mapping framework, we mostly learn about, um, about our surroundings through travel, through actually being out, out and about. Um, this conceptualization is called a path-based conceptualization. Basically, we, we learn by moving through space. And there, um, uh, he passed away, unfortunately, but there's a geographer at UC Santa Barbara named Reginald Gollidge who um, spent a lot of time developing many of these theories. Uh, what this boils down to in terms of what people are doing, we, we call it wayfinding. We call it the you know, search, exploration, path selection. This process of wayfinding facilitates spatial learning. Uh, one of the important things for the research I'm gonna to present to you is that there's an idea of choice points. Choice points are places in space where people are actively making choices about where to go and what to do. And there have been some interesting findings in that area that people learn more when they're actively engaged in travel and at choice points people are learning more. So that's, that's just something tied to my research. And here is the theory of spatial learning um, represent, how, as, as it's unfolded in a way in this literature that talks about three steps, three stages in how people learn about, uh, how people learn about their surroundings. And, we have three levels of knowledge, three, three levels that aren't just about the extent of knowledge, but the quality of that knowledge. And so the first stage is landmark learning. And that's, um, that's positive to be what people learn about first when they come to, into a new environment um, are landmarks. So you know, knowing, where, um, knowing that generally um, Bavaro Hall is over here or Campbell Hall is over there. And you can look for those buildings, but you don't really know the in-between very much. And so that's, that's positive to be the first stage, and people rely on landmarks more when they don't know anything else. Um, then you start to create routes, so your mind is able to construct actual routes that um, lead from one place to another, and so you have a sense of being on the right path. So that comes next. And then the final stage is when everything comes together into what's called survey knowledge, but basically it's having a more, more or less of a map inside of your head. And so that is, that is the third stage. And in this theory of spatial learning, the third stage is, is are you to be better than the first stage, I mean, in some sense. That you have, you're able to make better decisions about where to go and what to do when you have survey knowledge than when you just have landmark knowledge. So that, that's the theory in a nutshell, and that's what I base some of this research on. Now, what I looked at, and I'll, I'll show you the, 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 this survey that I conducted uh, in, in a second, 
are differences between what I call active and passive travelers, which is why, again, active may be independent travelers. Um, this, is, you know, this is where I'm thinking some of the linkages lie. Um, but in this context, which is a Los Angeles context, the active travelers were people who, again, some of these, are, some of these people are older, so some are drivers and some are walkers. And then passive travelers are transit users and passengers in cars. And I was looking for differences in the cognitive maps of active travelers, people actively engaged in finding their way through space, than passive, than passive individuals who were <coughs> basically being conveyed on a bus or by, um, by someone else. And I did the research uh, in South Central Los Angeles. There's uh, the survey site um, was one location. It was a uh, shopping center at the crossing of two light rail lines. Um, the blue line and the green line, if you know Los Angeles. And uh, close to Watts, close to Compton. Um, the reason I chose that location is, one, because the, um, the transportation needs of this, of this population are much greater, but also because there are a lot of transit users, and I want to be able to compare between different modes of travel. Many parts of Los Angeles, everyone's a driver, so I wanted to find somewhere where I could compare transit users and drivers, um, passengers and cars, and and so, again, this is important to say, where I started with this was not looking at children. And so I looked at adults to begin with. And so the survey looks at adults all the way down to age 18. So I have some information on, on youth, on, on people just moving out of adolescence. But I started by looking at adults um, because I didn't realize that I should be thinking about this in the long term. I thought it was all about how adults um, are making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And anyway, I interviewed about 200 and um, looked at how they traveled during the day, um, what they knew, cognitive mapping sorts of, um, getting cognitive map uh, information from them, spatial knowledge, and then control, social economic status, um, spatial location where they live, which is important for this kind of geographic research. So one of the things that I asked people to do was draw maps. And, um, I didn't ask them to draw a map of their neighborhood, I asked them to draw routes, you know, focusing on this kind of path-based conceptualization. I asked them to draw how they got from one place to another. And, uh, you know, here's an example of a map that somebody drew um, from their house to the survey site to that shopping center. And this is a pretty good one. There's a north arrow, which is kind of amazing. Um, and they have, they have one, um, they have one off-route landmark, they have lost towers there. Um, but mostly they, you know, they're focused on a, a, on a simple route and um, labeling some, uh, labeling some uh, cross streets and uh, one metro station as they go along. Um, other maps for a little more, um, uh, other maps have a very different quality, certainly no north arrow, in fact no real certainty about directionality at all, but they have an ABC kind of, well I started at my house, I went to the bus stop and I ended up at the shopping center. And they, they represented that. That's pretty good, actually. Um, you know, other transit users showed every stop along the way, so that's, that's actually um, you know a, a pretty uh, detailed map in some ways. Um, and then other people didn't really draw anything at all. They just said, "Okay, I came from 116th place, went to the Avalon train stop, ended up at the Imperial Station, which is which is where the shopping center was." And then uh, I got a few of these too, so you know, unable to answer and. Uh, I think that's important. Not everyone has the ability to even answer these questions. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about that in the context of, um, of you know, my survey population and their ages, too, in a second. But anyway, so what did I do? I came up with something fairly simple. Um, you know, part of the cognitive mapping analysis methods that are accepted is to break maps up into their component parts, kind of landmarks and routes, all these, all these um, elements that are hypothesized to be part of the spatial learning or the developmental process. I broke them up, and so I counted landmarks, um, things that specifically were, um, were waypoints along the way, um, things like City Hall, um, things like a metro station, things like, um, and a metro station meaning along the way, not, not an actual place where they transfer, so that had to be carefully done. And then, um, I also looked at routes. I counted the number of segments it took to get somewhere. Um, and I also focused specifically on choice points. So again, the idea of places where they felt it was worth drawing that they changed direction, that they did something 
specific in, in how they got there. And so you can count basically the turns in some ways, one, two, three, four, but whatever it is, it's you know, up to six. And, and you can, you know, I had multiple coders do this so that I could come up with an, with an average response because I think there is some judgment sometimes about all of these, all, all of these measures. And I did something rather simple. I looked at a number of different ways of, of actually comparing people's, uh, people's maps, but in the end, I, I ended up using a pretty simple ratio of the number of landmark elements in their maps to the choice points in their maps, so all of those terms. And so comparing basically landmark knowledge to route-based knowledge. So basically the context of travel to the actual route itself, and just creating a ratio. Yeah. I have a quick question about the methodology of doing that. So yeah. I know that there's, mm -hmm. if I'm remembering, Correctly. I believe I've heard some work that when people give directions, there are differences between males and females, and whether they give landmarks or yeah. map. And I'm, mm -hmm. How did you sort of think about that in mm -hmm. terms of are some people just yeah. more prone to, to identifying mm -hmm. via landmarks versus via? Definitely. There are a lot of correlates, um, and, and, being, and uh, being female is one of them, absolutely. Um, and, and you know, I, I attempted to control for these okay. things, and uh, and yeah, absolutely. Um, being female um, indicated greater reliance on on um, on landmarks, and um, I'll, I'll get to it, but uh, okay. you know, less accuracy. But it is true; everyone is different, and I think that um, and I think that absolutely, you have to look at this over a, a broad population because there are a lot of potential effects going on in terms of the individual, in terms of spatial ability. Um, some of which are maybe, maybe, um, uh, well, I think a lot of them are probably um, learned differences, but, but we can discuss that as well, because it is interesting. So this ratio, um, and it's kind of stages, uh, stages of spatial learning, like I talked about. And what I found was that passive travelers, so people who weren't conveying themselves around the city, but were being conveyed, um, were much more reliant on landmarks. And th this is not necessarily, based on everything I've told you, not necessarily a great surprise. I mean, what matters from a transportation planning perspective is that um, it's the modes of travel, it's transit use, it's, um, it's transit use, it's being driven as a passenger, that shows this greater reliance on landmark elements. And then active travelers, people who only ever reported driving or walking, and I think it's interesting, those modes are very different in terms of experience. The thing that unites them is that um, they are uh, their <coughs> forms of independent mobility, I suppose, being a driver or being a walker. Um, they were much less reliant on landmarks. So um, normally I don't uh, present um, regressions that aren't that exciting, um, but or that that the results, um, you know, that uh, some of the, uh, the the probabilities don't necessarily reach that 0.05 just because. Um, people in some audiences get upset about that. But I just wanted to present this to you because this includes age, and it gives me at least a hint that um, th what this is, what the, uh, what the dependent variable here, here is, is that landmark choice point ratio. And what the, um, and so basically what it's, and the higher the landmark choice point ratio, the more reliance on landmarks there is relative to choice points. And what it shows is that controlling for other factors, certainly how people travel was significant. Um, time spent in the neighborhood is potentially significant as well. Long, the longer you live in the neighborhood, um, uh, interestingly enough, the more you rely on landmarks. But another interesting factor, um, which, which is funny, and, and, and ha I, I need to think about that one some more, but um, another factor is that the younger you are, the more you rely on so the older you are, the less you rely on landmarks. So there is a reliance on this early stage of knowledge for the younger survey respondents. So, and I went down to 18, basically, is where I had to stop. And I looked at the correlations. For this, for this presentation, I looked at the correlations, and they're pretty interesting. Um, I looked at this in a number of different ways. Drawing maps is only one way of getting at all of this. I asked people to describe the location of their home, and um, the passive travelers use landmarks two and a half times more than um, active travelers, although they use streets and cross streets relatively equally. Um, passive and active travel, again, for describing work location in this case, um, the passive travelers use streets and cross streets less. Now, work is further away than home, so they have less familiarity. 
uh, landmarks were equal, but streets and cross streets, which would be maybe root knowledge, they used less of it. And then I also just asked questions about relative difference. Which one do you think is closer or further away? And, um, and uh, the passive travelers were significantly likely to be wrong more often. So you know, you, one, one can ask, well, what does it matter that people are more reliant on landmarks? Well, for access, for issues of access to opportunities, um, there's less accuracy, or at least that's, you know, that's what I was interested in. Um, and it's also true in other sorts of questions, asking people how far away something is. Um, the variability of the answers in the passive traveler group, and that it's a standard deviation, these are standard deviation measures, for example. Um, the variability in the answers given by passive travelers is much larger than active travelers, all around a tendency of getting the right answer of how far away is Los Angeles City Hall from the survey site, which basically means they were getting it wrong more often, whereas the active travelers seem to know how far away something is. Now, it's important to say they had the choice of either naming distance or time. So they could have named time, and they, you know, they still got it more, you know, there was still more variability. The wrongness is less important than the variability in the answer. Um, and again, I, I controlled for a number of different factors, um, including years in neighborhood. Um, but I think that, uh, but I, I think that, you know, years in neighborhood is one thing, age is another thing. And what I found is that, again, there were some correlations between being less accurate and being younger as well, which is even controlling for how long someone had been in the neighborhood. And I think that's, um, I think there's something interesting there. So that's the research that I did. And again, when I started out, um, you know, my IRB approval, um, when I started out, I thought I was looking at an issue of the, for, for adults. Um, since then, I, you know, I came to realize that, oh, this is all about long-term learning processes, or at least one that I'm interested in. And so it may be important to look at, at young people as well. And so since then, I've gone on and looked at this in a number of different ways. This is not a cognitive mapping methodology. This is looking at a uh, way of measuring space called activity space. Um, act, uh, acti or a way of thinking about space um, called activity spaces, which is basically as I love the 70s drawing that, it, that kind of represents activity spaces, it shows that everyone's daily lives occur across a field of the actual city, you know, an actual place. And what this shows is that somebody who walks everywhere will have a much more narrow or tight activity space. Now, I'm not talking about qualitative differences here, than somebody who's biking. And obviously, you can extend that to transit, you can extend that to drivers. Um, it's a measure of the experience of the city in some ways. And so some of the interesting findings that I've had around looking at activity spaces is that there are more accurate predictors measuring the actual area that people um, roam around in, uh, in a city is actually a better predictor of outcomes like in, uh, or um, socioeconomic factors like income than measures that transportation researchers often use, like miles traveled, for example. Like that, is, miles traveled is less relevant than how much territory has been covered um, to some of these factors like income. Now, I think it's important to say that it's not just about how widely you roam, it's also about what's inside the activity space and what you're learning about, what you're seeing and doing in the space. But at the same time, this, the extent, I think, has some relevance. And so this is, um, you know, this is, this is data that I, um, was using to look at some, you know, some of these larger issues about how people actually use use neighborhoods. But what I did here is I pulled out specifically different age groups. And so let me explain. I have a, you know, a, a left hand and a right hand y axis. On the left hand, um, on the left hand, I have walking rates um, at different points in life. And so from six to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, 21 to 25, and up to 30. And what it shows is that, um, oh, actually, and, and that's the, uh, that's very importantly, that's the blue line. That's the blue line. And what it shows is that a six to 10 year olds on non school days, so, you know, I'll be interested to hear what you think of this because um, this is something that I think might be the right approach. Um, when I'm thinking about how people use cities, the trip to school back and forth is really a repeated trip that's just done over and over again. I'm kind of interested in what people are doing and what, uh, what adolescents and everyone else is doing when they're not going to school or they're not going to work. And so this looks at non-school days, basically, weekends. 
And what it shows is that from you know, this is this is an average for Southern California. I used a travel survey in Southern California. What it shows is that six to ten, about 14 percent of trips in Southern California are by walking. It peaks at 18 percent from 11 to 15, and then it drops as people get older, as 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 children age and they become adults, the amount of walking they do decreases. And at the same time, not surprisingly, the size of their activity spaces um, hits a low point at 11 to 15 years, and then it grows and it grows and it grows, and it starts growing actually um, somewhat exponentially um, as people get older. Now, what I think is interesting about this is that there's some kind of inflection point where children start to take over their own decision making about where they go. And when they start to do that, they actually have very small territories. They don't go very far. And they're walking a lot. And then things start to change. And suddenly, they are ranging more and more widely until they're grown ups. And they, um, they're probably, in Los Angeles at least, doing a lot of driving. And um, what I'm very interested in is, or at least one of the things that I'm interested in is, what what is that inflection point? What does it mean and how does it happen? And what does it mean for the skills that, um, that people need to be able to range much more widely? Now, it's also important to say that was an average for all of, all of Southern California. Um, we can look at this very spatially specifically as well. And, um, and what I did here was take the size of activity spaces for the individuals living in different neighborhoods, and I just mapped it. And what it shows is that there are some places where People don't get as far, um, and this is 11 to 20 year olds, so it's, it's the entire range from 11 to 20, just to get a large enough sample to do a map like this. Um, again, this, these are weekend trips, these are um, not school trips, but all the trips taken on a weekend. Um, it shows that there are places where people don't go very far, again, kind of south central Los Angeles. In those areas, um, uh, people don't make it very far, on a, uh, children don't make it very far on a weekend, compared to the west side of Los Angeles, and the San Fernando Valley and the eastern suburbs, um, there are some real differences. Now, of course, like I said, it doesn't necessarily say anything about what is inside of those activity spaces in terms of the built environment, in terms of the opportunities inside of them, and those are things that, uh, that I've looked at as well, and certainly it really varies a lot. Um, you know, a suburban built environment is so different than a traditional downtown or something like that. So, potential findings and implications from, from this specific research. Um, I think that it's fair to at least argue that how we understand cities changes over the lifespan. And certainly what I focused on was knowledge of opportunities, where things are, how far away are they. And um, I didn't get into the details, but I asked a lot of questions during those relative distances about job centers and um, recreational opportunities. Health, you know, health centers, things like that. Um, I think that I've started to be able to argue that reliance on landmarks is a particularly important of, um, of navigation for people who are at the early phases of developing their cognitive maps, and that um, should include young adults. Um, you know, statistically, I was not able to show that correlation as strongly as I would like, but certainly, um, certainly it was there. Um, certainly it was there. Um, I think that active travel engages spatial learning. I'm not the only one to argue this, as the theory says, but even in, even in a real urban context, I was able to, to show that. Um, and is active travel the same as independent travel? I think that's, um, I think that's interesting to think about. Um, urban legibility, which is very much of a designer's word, legibility, is gonna be different depending on how you travel. So the ability to understand what's around you and what's available to you in terms of opportunities is really going to vary depending on whether you're in charge of yourself, whether you're walking around, or whether somebody's taking you there. How much control you have um, might, might really matter for this legibility issue. And I think overall, I'd like to be able to argue that planners at least need to treat travel as an integral part of the overall urban experience. So, we need to be able to say that how we get around cities, or, or we should be saying that how we get around cities really matters for our perceptions of place, of, um, of belongingness, for all of these sorts of uh, characteristics that planners like to think about when they talk about neighborhoods. 
Um, now, here's some future directions that really reflect, I'm going to start more narrow and then broaden out a little bit to, to bring in the questions that I really have for you. But, um, but let me start here. I think that, you know, this was really a starting point for me, and I didn't, I've not ended up where I started in terms of what the big issues are. And now, I think that there are some extensions that, that I certainly want to be looking at. Um, I want to look at the issue of sustainable travel and how to promote that through urban legibility. There was a project that I think you guys had some collaboration in with um, Matthew Trowbridge, um, looking at building a school in, um, in Buckingham, Virginia. And um, what I found really interesting was that um, design was used to encourage all kinds of behaviors within a school environment. I think that it would be really interesting to think about how to encourage, so, uh, encourage different kinds of behaviors, especially sustainable behaviors, in the urban environment more broadly. I don't know that it's easy to do, but I think that it's worth thinking about. Um, the role of information technologies in youth travel is, is certainly an important area, and I do some other research looking specifically at information. I think that spatial learning is changing significantly because of smartphones and internet searches, that GPS that tells you where to go. And I, I kind of think, and I'd be interested to hear if you agree, I think that matters to some degree. Um, if, if spatial learning is a skill that people should have or associated um, effects are, are important and relevant, then not figuring out where you're going and, um, and having a computer tell you where you're going might matter. So that's something I want to look at. Um, one of the things that I didn't do is I really was very focused on dimensionality of space, um, how far things work. I think that there are other dimensions, um, and you know, in some ways, um, it's not all about just safety and security, but I didn't even measure that. I would like to go back and look at these issues. Um, attachment to place, place attachment, engagement, um, being interested in a place, or, uh, or um, feeling good or bad about it. So these affective dimensions of place, I didn't measure. And then just this activity space um, notion, what I did was fairly crude using a regional travel survey. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to look at it in a much more focused level. How do, people, how do, how do as adolescents actually spend their days? Where do they go in a very fine-grained way? What are the places? How do they use public spaces? Um, there's, there's research on this, of course. But I'd like to be able to use some of these methods, compare them to cognitive maps, for example, and really do some more in-depth work at some of this. So that, those are things that I thought um, in one direction. Now I think there's broader questions as well, and um, that's why I'm excited that, that Patrick invited me, and I, I'd like to get some thoughts. Um, uh, learning and travel. Um, I'm, I'm curious. You know, there's a theory of spatial learning that geographers have developed, environmental psychologists and geographers. Um, does that have relevance to anything that you're looking at? Um, does that have relevance to other types of learning? other developmental processes. Um, inquiring minds want to know. Mm -hmm. um, what about learning outside of school, just generally? Um, you know, I think it's, it's clear that it's important that you know, learning occurs in many environments and at all times. But, um, but is there a role for planners in all of that, in, in those questions? And can we do something to make, um, to make, uh, make urban spaces better for, for outcomes? better for, for developmental outcomes, youth outcomes. How can we, can we possibly describe that? Um, I think that what are, you know, neighborhood effects are, um, neighborhood, neighborhood effects are an area that we've always been interested in, but um, like I said, um, the neighborhoods are changing fast, and planners are trying to rebuild neighborhoods in the image of old neighborhood unit ideas that, you know, go back 100 years. Um, is this a good thing? Is this helpful? Um, is, will, it, will it be useful to kids to be able to wander around a public square or something like that that hasn't existed for a long time? Um, or is it actually, if it's regulated, just like all urban spaces regulated today, will it make no difference? Uh, those are some questions that I have. Um, like I said, there is a growing linkage between health research, and in fact, we have a Center for Design and Health that can um, between health research and, and urban planning and urban design research. Um, part of the health, you know, part of the dimensions of health includes social and psychological health. 
I think that um, it's not that much further to talk about um, uh, about development in some ways. And so I, you know, I love to hear what you think about all of that. And so um, with that, um, I'd love to spend some time just talking to you. Um, thanks. Self-preservation plays such a huge role, and I think it's got to be a driver for a lot of these choices, especially in places where there are real dangers. Now, I wonder. I mean, you know, it's it's interesting to think about. You know, what can we do about that? I mean, one is to address gang violence. I suppose that's you know that's that's certainly the the, the main solution. The, block. the yeah. broader yeah. solution, and I think it's always important to think about that when we, you know, environmental determinism is a problem that that sometimes we have in China. Everything is about environment, when really there's a lot of other things at play. But I think that absolutely, um, it's worth looking at. You know, what are the implications of all of that on their on their days, on on the opportunities that that they're missing out on, um, on the services that the city is trying to provide for them that they can't gain access to. And I, you know, I think there's a spatial or geographic aspect to it, and an urban planning aspect to it. But I think that yeah, that that is. Um, that's really interesting, you know. And I think that, you know, how how do you break that down is another question. Um, uh, even if it, even if it's not about life or death, I mean, what do you need to do to get people to explore other parts of their cities? Whether it's because of gang violence or whether it's just what you know. One of the things I wanted to talk about was whether again I looked at different modes. Just because people don't have cars all the time and and kids don't have cars, how do you get them to really start to learn about all the opportunities? Um, in big cities, you know, we, our cities tend to be growing. Um, how do you get across DC or Chicago or Los Angeles and really start to know about what's out there? So do you ever combine any of that thing with sort of interviews about, so why do you choose this route, right? So what is it that goes into your determination? Mm -hmm. Is it this is the shortest distance? Is it safety? Mm -hmm. Is it, you know, this is a more pleasant walk? What well, that's that's what the next step is for me, absolutely, is, is you know, I, it really was a mapping exercise is where I started, and um, I think that the reasons why are now are now one of the, the critical dimensions that that I haven't captured. Now, there's some interesting things. I think, you know, the difference between reality and perception is always going to be, you know, for this in this method or in this conceptualization is always going to be critical. And so I want to start to do that a little bit. Um, you know, we can talk about crime. We can talk about pollution. We can, you know, the fact that what seems dirty and dangerous versus what actually is really dirty and dangerous might be really different, and talk about ways we need to um, provide better information um, to, uh, to people who are playing in the park alongside a highway and things like that. You know, I don't want to ruin the fun of, of life, um, but I, I actually want to make it more fun, actually. But, um, but I think those questions between perception and reality are, are part of this, and I haven't done it yet. So this is sort of a related to a case study. Uh, we've been, so far what we were interested in is sort of relating the psychological map to the environment, the physical map yeah. in the sense of yeah. 
in particular, this question, there are two parts to the question. One is, what, what places in that in your neighborhood do you find interesting? Do you want to be? Yeah, exactly. And then where's the say? What's the correspondence to that? Yeah. And that where adolescents tend to spend a lot of time and where risk is tend to be related. And yeah. it's, it, do, it doesn't seem to be because they like risk. It's that they have relatively few environments in which mm -hmm. they're allowed to spend much time. You know, school and some community thing, mm -hmm. you know, after school program. Mm -hmm. And so it, we're kind of interested in trying to unravel this question of, so is it just where there's a lot of kids there's going to be risk because when there's mm -hmm. risk to hurt for people yeah. are? Yeah. Or is there something about having a bunch of adolescents together in these kinds of uh, areas and, and where in the neighborhoods do they consider dangerous and not? And I guess one of the pieces we, we think is in there, we, we're really struggling with the methodology on this, is mm -hmm. uh, they don't, they think of danger as kind of like where they're unwelcome, as opposed to where they're literally threatened right. in some way. Yeah. So um, it's almost a wrong question to ask them where it's safe. It's more asking where they feel like they can be and mm -hmm. not be seen as a problem. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well. And you know, I, I wonder how easy this would be to do because part of it is getting them to answer the right question. Right. Part of it is knowing where they're really going. I don't know, I mean, it is tracking a little bit. So again, on the activity space side a little bit, mapping what they're really doing. And, and that's really hard. I mean, they have to want to be willing to participate. And if you're going somewhere that has risk associated with it, you're not going to want to be tracked. Michael Mason is over at VCU has been doing beepers with these guys. And they, and you know, beep them and you say, where are you going? And they say, you know, two things that happen, and this is true in beeper research in general, people get to where they forget that they're being, that's interesting. you know, they just get acclimated to it. It's not a reality show. But also that they don't seem like yeah. as concerned about telling you about dangerous situations as you think they should be. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. that, that's, that's hilarious. And good to know. Um, yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, people don't mind, I guess, you know, as long as well, they, they, these are adolescents. I don't know about adults if they have yeah. they have adolescents, adolescents mm -hmm. and, but, but people who do deeper research for 30 years now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they find people tend to mm -hmm. sort of very quickly lose consciousness of the fact that they're mm -hmm. being asked for some questions. Yeah. And they have to be thoughtful about it. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, untangle, like you said, it's a matter of untangling the, the realities of you know, what they perceive as the right place to be versus where we want them to be versus where they actually are. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a mapping question and a spatial question. And that's what I yeah. wonder, what's going on with your fit is that the places yeah. that kids can be, mm -hmm. um, and they have less choice as you were indicating, but the number of places in a given neighborhood that are made for young children mm -hmm. and made for families and things like that, and the extent to which they accompany their parents to various Versus there's a relatively constricted set of areas where adolescents can be, particularly unless they're going to be accompanying their parents. Yes. So we don't like adolescents, you know, no. just being out and about. We want them in certain areas where they're no, absolutely. Certain places. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, I think there's some interesting uh, uh, associations between what you're talking about mm -hmm. and so some of the other things that I didn't present on it. But, you know, the whole idea of places as they used to exist. And so, this again is a broader, broader area of thinking um, in terms of not just youth or not just adults, but there's a great Italian word called the passeggiata, mm -hmm. which is this nightly event where people all come out of their houses and wander around and look at each other and talk to each other and, and gossip about each other. And it's really a free-for-all in, in the city. And people can you know, do what they want and kids can go off and do the things they want to do, but Everyone's kind of in the mix, and it, there's no, you know, there's there aren't the same boundaries. But that's a very old model of living in cities. That's kind of evaporated. And so we went through an era. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it hasn't evaporated, but it might have changed. Um, we went through an era of where kids were cruising in cars yeah. on main streets, and then we legislated that away. Or, you know, we got rid of that. And I just, I just, I'm really interested in that about what have we done as city designers to make this challenge even harder than it already is, or what, or what should we do? You just, you made, uh, don't mean to take too much, but the new urbanism kind of idea yeah. of recreating the uh, small neighborhood. Yeah. 
and where we lived in Chicago was in one of the first suburbs of Chicago. So it was built with big front porches and all the things that new urbanism says you're supposed to do to get people out. Mm -hmm. And that's what people did in the evening. They got out and you were and you just didn't realize the kids were out and they had they were able to congregate the adults were out and gossiping and visiting and all these sorts of things occurred in a way that yeah. And maybe it never got too dangerous. You know, it never got well, and too it and it was, yeah, it was it was dangerous because there were lots of people around mm -hmm. and kind of some in some collective way keeping an eye. Yeah. And what about, is, is there something important to development that, that adolescents do have these places where they can be independent? I think so. <laughs> I mean, so you're here. That's the $64,000 question here. Okay. Yeah. And for me, for me as well, if you, know, if you want to argue that this is important, um, which I think I really do. Um, any other specific questions or? Um, yeah. Um, my question was, have you looked at any elderly people in all of this, and how does that relate? I mean, a lot of times they're really similar in terms of mobility and mm -hmm. um, distance travel. Yeah. Um, there is, there is. Interestingly enough, um, I, I've been working in fits and starts uh, with an app developer um, who wants to develop a. a wayfinding solution for the elderly specifically and for um, the elderly with even with dementia potentially which pushes it to an even you know an even more specific area but but yeah the issues are very the issues can be very similar in that they relate to the world in a very different way they um, they they need um, they need more help in getting around um, they are more apt to get lost and so, and they just understand the world in a more basic sort of way. And so developing, you know, Google Maps doesn't do much good for, um, for a lot of people in, at that stage in life. And so I, I've been talking to a developer about thinking about just those issues. Um, I, do, I do think it matters. And I think what's interesting at that end of, of the lifespan there, there, you know, is a re there's research that it absolutely being um, being mobile and, and walking and doing all these things does have definitive benefits, not just physical definitive benefits, but on on some sort of um, well-being, mental well-being, and things like that. So, so there are some really interesting considerations of that as well. Um, that yeah, that I'm definitely really thinking about. But. You know, at the same time, I think that in terms of long-term outcomes, and you know, where I started with all of this was making the city more usable for a population and how to make that possible. I just now coming to the end of it, and you know, it's funny. This, you know, like I said, this is tied to my dissertation. It just so happens it was, you know, the concluding chapter of my dissertation was all about about the fact that this is a form of learning. I think, or I'd like to argue that it is, and um, how it, how it integrates into uh, things that are currently being looked at, I'm, I'm not sure yet, but I do think that for planners that want people to be able to take advantage of all the opportunities available to them in cities, we need to start earlier than when they get into the car in the morning. We need to think about how they live in cities starting pretty early in life. And um, so, you know, I, I think, um, you know, hopefully, um, I don't know. Some of these, some of these questions are things that maybe can't be answered in, you know, in a single discussion. But um, I'd love to, uh, you know, some figure out a way to hear from you and, and uh, you know, and kind of continue this conversation in some way or another. Well, thank you. We're, we're, that's part of why we're glad you're here. We're excited to have you be connected to youth next because that's exactly the kind of thing we want to. That's posture. Yeah. Um, that's that's exciting. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, it was it was good um, to to walk over here. <laughs> Not a dreary day. It was uh, warm is better than cold as far as I know. Are you getting a feel for the layout of UVA? Or? It helps. It helps. This is you know I just I forged a path I had never walked on before to, to get over here. So I crossed that one bridge, the, uh, um, which I it, it took me a while to find the bridge, even though I knew it was that driven. Uh, yeah. So I see these things matter. <laughs> now we're on your cognitive map. Right? I am. So we can put this as part of the, the, the crown. Yeah, exactly. Well, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. Thank